Yeah, does this, can you hear me okay? Should I have my water on? Hello. Thanks for being here. So we're going to talk about the mystifying accessibility today. Um, Sarah Chizari, I'm UX researcher, and we have Jen here. She's a senior interaction designer. We're going to talk about how to build a UI component um, for screen uh, reader users. So I want you to close your eyes for a few seconds. I promise I'm not going to play in any magic or anything, but close your eyes for a few seconds and imagine that you are going to browse the web while your eyes are closed. It might sound terrifying, but uh, you will have a torch. The torch will light up a small piece of this space for you as you are browsing the web. So. Imagine that situation, and this, that situation that I'm describing is how blind users are actually using the web. So now you can open your eyes and imagine you are developing the content of the web for those types of people. The context is a dark space. No one can see the screen that you are developing. They can't actually see the whole page or anything. They can, they're only able to see a small piece of your screen at a time if they are using a screen readers. So um, how would you design or develop something for that context? So we're going to walk you through how we did it, how we did with the Pattern Fly team at Red Hat, the UXD design team. So um, the analogy here is that the web for blind users is a, is a huge, dark, massive space, and that has huge amount of information. For people who are blind to use it, they have to have this torch called the screen readers that will allow them to light up a small piece of space at a time. So again, we will walk you through to tell you how we did it. So another activity for you guys. So can you guys, by show of hand, can you tell me who in the audience can read the information on the screen? Is there anyone? No one. So honestly, you guys all see this on the screen. You know there's information up there, but it's still not accessible to you. And the point I'm trying to uh, make here is that accessibility is more than designing for disability, because at this point, you guys are 100% able to see the information. You know the information is up there, but it's not accessible. So the only reason you can't actually access it is because you're not familiar with the language. So accessibility and designing for accessibility is a lot more than designing for disability. We have to think about usability and understanding users' needs and their capabilities. So um, this is the actual definition of accessibility. Designing, um, accessibility is designing for usability for the people with the widest range of um, capabilities. So why should you care? Um, actually, it's the law out there that if you are dealing with government, education, and nonprofit organization, there is a standard level of accessibility that you have to meet. So if those customers are important to you, you definitely have to meet some levels of accessibility. And um, also, good accessibility is good usability. So usability and accessibility, they are not synonyms. There are different words that have different meanings. But in order for you to have a great usability of product, you definitely have to include great uh, accessibility. And if you are including accessibility in your design, it's not gonna be, you're not going to be targeting a small portion of users out there. Because if you have a good accessibility of product, it's going to benefit a large population 
population out there. For example, in this picture, if we have a, if a ramp for a wheelchair, this guy didn't have to carry the uh, bicycle with him. So again, accessibility is good usability. And when you're designing the, in, like products or application, you have to bear in mind that you're going to use this product in the future. Your abilities, your um, needs, your capabilities are going to change over the time. So definitely have this in your mind when you're designing. You're designing for the future you. And the more you wait to address accessibility of your product, the more it's going to be tougher and harder for you to do it because accessibility is going to affect uh, all aspects of your design. So the earlier you, uh, the earlier you plan to uh, include accessibility, the easier to build. And, um, and if you test early in the process, it's much easier to build and it's going to be much nicer at the end. Um, so when you're designing for accessibility, try not to prioritize one group of users over the other ones and uh, try not to deprioritize one small group of users because when it comes to accessibility, it really doesn't matter how big those population group is. So imagine your own company. If there is 100,000 employees in your company and there's only one wheelchair user, you definitely have to have a ramp for that one user. So think about that when you're designing a web accessibility because, well, if there's only one user out there that needs accessibility um, web technology, you definitely have to give them that chance. So accessibility and inclusive design always go hand in hand. And um, you definitely want to make sure you design something that uh, meets everyone's needs and capabilities, and you come up with one common solution that, um, that works for everyone. I love this quote. It says, we are all just temporarily abled. So basically, when you're designing for accessibility, you're not, again, designing for one small population because we, uh, at some point in life, we will have some sort of disabilities that we will benefit from the accessibility uh, features that we have developed. So talking about different users, we already talked about different types of users we have out there. But on top of that, we have different devices, and those different, different devices uh, require different inputs and they have different types of outputs. So there is a huge combination of a combination of preferences and users out there. We have large different users and different uh, preferences to using to use those products. And um, again, to be honest, it's not easy and it's not going to be doable to design, personalize, or customize experience for each of those preferences. So at the end of the day, we have to come up with one solution that works for everyone. Um, well, as I said, when it comes to accessibility, number doesn't really matter. If there's only one person who needs accessibility technology, we have to provide it. But just to put you in the context and say how, how significant that requirement is, we have one five point billion users out there that have some sort of disabilities. And um, that, um, that is 20% of the world's population. Um, today's presentation is going to be about users who have um, some sort of visual impairments and developing things that is um, usable for them. So just to put you in the context, there are 256 million visually impaired people out there who are using the internet. And out of those um, 200 something million, there are 36 million people that are 100% blind and sightless, meaning that they, don't, they can't even see anything that you develop on the web. So a um, little bit about who are these people. So Norwegian people, they rely on text, uh, audio, and haptic data. And they benefit so much from the semantic HTML, information architecture, and all cons uh, contents and controls available as text. They have this superpower that many sighted people don't have. They're able to listen and understand um, screen readers in very high speed. And um, just to show you an example of how um, like this superpower sounds like, I'm going to play something from the screen reader. And I'm just, I want you to listen and try to understand how what what it means and what it says, so um, go ahead and, and give it a listen.
Is there anyone in the room who understood a word, more than a word? So yes, this is the superpower they have. They have this um, incredible talent of understanding this audio. There was nothing wrong about the quality of this audio. It was 100% high quality of the recorded of a, a screen reader. So they are able to understand this in even higher speed. So when you're designing for accessibility, you have to bear in mind that although they don't have the visual um, abilities, but they are able to do something else that we are not familiar with it. Also, when talking about low vision people, um, they rely on contrast, font size, and audio a lot. And um, this group of participants or users are in a broader range than the no vision people. They have the ability to use the screen readers and also all sort of other assistive technologies, such as this one that you see on the screen. So at, um, at Red Hat with Pattern Fly team, we, we started accessibility effort and uh, to understand if the, if the components and whatever we are developing is usable for these users, we decided to go to the actual users and see things from their perspectives. Do want, we wanted to observe how they interact with our products and whatever we developed. So we decided to work with this, the, this school that uh, there's a, a school called Govern near Moorhead School down in Raleigh. It's actually a flagship, uh, it's a flagship school for blind and um, we started working with them to make sure, uh, to test our products and see how, how they perceive, how, how they interact with the products. This is a picture of the students that we worked with. We started working, um, there are like 10 to, uh, 10 to 12 students, they are junior high school uh, students and we started working with them since November 2017. We did a couple of activities with them the one that we want to talk about is the co-design and development and testings that we did with them every week. So we went to school um, to work with two Norwegian students, and we had, a, we had one designer, one developer, and one researcher in the sessions. And what we did was to test various implementation of the components that we had. We gave them um, the, the components, we gave them tasks, and we observed them how, how they interact with the system, and we, we heard them out as they were working with the system to see the expectation and the, their preferences. We, uh, we went for their preferences using the device and the screen readers. There was a, one student who was very comfortable with JAWS, which is one of the screen readers that is out there, and she used Windows uh, laptop, and we had another student who used iPad, and she has voiceover there. So as they were working with the system, we um, observed them how they interact, how, uh, what they hear from the screen readers, how they react, what they expect, and what they prefer. So these were the questions that we were trying to figure out as we were working with them. So what we learned from them, I'm going to just tell you high level findings of what we learned and then going to talk you through the technical finding of, um, uh, of, the, of their interaction with, the, with um, web components. So one thing we learned is that sighted keyword only users are not equal to no vision screen reader users, which is a misunderstanding out there. Keyboard accessibility does not equal screen reader accessibility. So again, if you are testing your product for accessibility, you can't actually just rely with, uh, rely on keyboard accessibility. You have to definitely test it with the people who actually use a screen reader. And then complying with web uh, accessibility standards is not enough. I know there are accessibility guidelines out there. It's good to follow them, but uh, you definitely still have to test it because complying with them wouldn't give you the best experience out there. Uh, we observed some, some, um, some situations that whatever, um, whatever presented to the uh, students wasn't and something that we expected to get from. So definitely we have to test to make sure everything is working just fine. And then the components that we develop is going to be affected and influenced by various technical issues, uh, such as devices, browsers, screen readers, and the modes of the screen readers that the user is actually using. And um, in a design workshop that we did with the students, uh, we observed something very interesting. The students, there were mostly no vision. There were some of them who had some uh, low vision, but um, still they did have some understanding of the visual aspects of the web, which was very interesting to us just to figure out. Um, and I'm going to leave you to read that quote from one of the participants um, when she was designing a, a, a web uh, page for us. And uh, I will ask Jen to take over and talk about the technical findings. Thank you, Sarah. Lynn, can you guys hear me okay? 
Is my microphone on close enough? So the first session we had with our screen reader participants was to have them teach us how they use a screen reader to navigate a web page. As part of this activity, we learned that the same general methods are available in most of the screen readers. They are different in terms of the exact key commands you would use and the results that get announced by each screen reader. Um, but we also noticed that JAWS provides the most full-featured, robust ex experience um, of all the screen readers. So for all the examples we show on this page and all the remaining slides, it's based on the JAWS inputs and, the out and outputs. So the first method they shared with us is how they go from the item that they're currently on and shift focus to the next item using the up down arrow keys. So it'll shift focus from the current element to the next element in the DOM when they hit the down arrow key. Another way of navigating through the web page is by using a specific key command to navigate to a specific type of element. So in JAWS, the user can hit the H key and it'll go to the next heading on the page or tab for links, B for buttons, or F for form elements. Um, buttons are also considered form elements. And in JAWS, there's so many um, different types of elements that you can navigate by that this is just a, one of the, the common sets of elements that these users would navigate by. Also, most screen readers provide the ability to open a dialog that will list a specific type of elements. So similar to the previous method, um, the user can enter a key command to open a dialog that lists all the headings on the page, for example. So without changing their focus on the page, they can easily scan all of the headings that are on the page to um, get a sense of the structure of the page and figure out where they need to go in that page to figure out what they're trying to do. So if it's the first time that they're visiting a site, the heading structure is very important. They will scan the headings, as shown here, to understand um, where they need to go to complete their task and to get familiar with that page, the same way that you would visually scan a page layout to understand the organization of that page. But if it's a, a site that they're already familiar with and they know what type of element they're looking for, whether it's a form element or a button, and so they will pull up a dialog that lists that type of element or use the specific key commands to navigate to that type of element. So to illustrate these methods, I'm going to share with you what JAWS announces for the sample HTML shown here. So this HTML would show as this example on the left on the screen. You can see that there are a couple of headings, there's a bulleted list of links and a paragraph. When the JAWS user hits the down arrow key, JAWS will announce heading level one accessibility guide. Then hitting down arrow again would announce list two items because the next item in the DOM is the unordered list. Then when they hit the down arrow key again, it announces both the list and the link as bullet, same page link, understanding users' needs. And then the next bullet, same page link, checklist. And then hitting down again would announce list in because they've come to the end of that list. If the user is using the H key to navigate by headings, um, it reverses the order. So now it announces the name of that heading first, accessibility guide, because they know that they're on a heading. And then it announces heading level one. And then the second um, time they hit the H key, it'll say understanding users' needs, heading level two. So these users, as Sarah demonstrated, they can listen pretty fast. So they'll run through pretty quickly um, using the, the keys to, to scan the contents of the page the same way that you just visually glance at it to understand the structure. And then here, again, is an example of the heading list dialog showing the headings that are in the sample HTML. So as I mentioned before, there are so many key commands available for almost any type of element that you can think of. I'm just going to take you through the links as an example. You would hit the tab key and it would take you to the first link on the page. And this this case, the context that it is a, a list item is no longer provided because it's just skipping straight to the links. And then here's an example of the links list dialog for those links as they would display on the page. So hopefully these methods illustrate the importance of providing a name that is meaningful because often when the screen reader user is 
navigating a page, these elements are pulled out of context. So you've all always heard that using a link name that says click here is really bad. And, and this is why, because when they pull up that list of links dialog, having a bunch of links that say click here, they have no way of knowing what those links actually do. Um, another thing to point out, though, is that even if you provide a meaningful name, it's important to check that if all of these links show up somewhere on the page, they should also have the same URL. If they happen to have different URLs but the same name, then that's going to be a major usability issue for your screen reader user. Another thing that these methods illustrate is the importance of having a heading outline that properly clarifies the structure of your page contents. So in the same example on the right, you can see that it's pretty easy to glance at those contents and understand the structure of the page. You can easily find the title, you can see the sections in the, content, in the page. But if you remove, remove those styles so that everything looks the same, it's much harder to glance at this example on the left and understand where you would need to go to find the contents you're looking for. And so providing the heading outline um, in a way that's semantic and, and properly identifies the heading levels um, and also using things like lists to properly define list items makes it much easier for the screen reader users to understand where to go to find the contents that they're looking for. The remaining sessions we had with participants was to review components that we were um, implementing for Patternfly. Two of the components we reviewed with them were a button menu and a navigation menu. We decided to start off with the button menu because we wanted to start with something that was fairly simple and basic because this was the first time we were doing any kind of activity like this with the participants, so we weren't really sure how it would go. And we also decided to use what we call the kebab menu because that icon looks like meat chunks on a stick. So with the button menu, we were interested in understanding how the screen reader user interacts with the toggle and the menu, but we were also interested in understanding how the screen reader perceives the label on that button when we use an icon instead of text for the button. So our implementation consisted of a button that included an SVG icon and then a div that had links for the menu items. We ended up testing two variations of this menu because in our first test, we noticed an issue with the voiceover. Um, so our first variation had both ARIA has pop-up set to true and then also included ARIA expanded set to false when the menu is hidden and then set to true when the menu is visible. We later realized that the issue with ARIA has, has pop-up um, it was more of an issue with the participant having an older version of, voice of, of the iOS on her iPad, and that version of VoiceOver did not support ARIA has pop-up. But we had also learned with that first variation that using just displayed none to hide the menu from screen readers resulted in some weird behavior with JAWS. So in our second variation, we ended up using the hidden attribute to hide the menu, um, both visually and from the screen reader. And we removed ARIA has pop-up um, because we wanted to test if there were different results when we only had ARIA, ha ARIA expanded. And so again, when the menu is visible, we remove that hidden attribute and ARIA expanded changes to true. Both variations had ARIA hidden set to true for the SVG icon to hide that element from the screen reader because in our case we were providing that meaningful name in the form of ARIA label on the button element itself and we labeled it more actions. So we noticed when we were testing this that the variation that had both ARIA has pop up and ARIA expanded in JAWS gets announced as more actions button menu, and this is regardless of what state the menu is in. The RA expanded attribute gets completely ignored in this case. But in our variation that had just RA expanded, JAWS would announce it as more actions button collapsed when the menu is hidden, and more, action, more actions button expanded when the menu is visible. 
When we reviewed these variations with our participants, the feedback we got from them was that either variation provided them with the information they needed to know that there was something they could do on that toggle to get something else. They both provided cues to the user that they could toggle to get more. And also in further uh, reviewing the W3C recommendations for ARIA has pop-up, we learned that there is an expectation on what role you assign to the pop-up that displays for the element that has that attribute. So it expects one of these five roles, menu, list box, tree, grid, or dialogue. So in our example with ARIA has pop-up, we should have used role menu for the, menu, the div that was the menu and the role menu item for the children links in that menu. Another thing we learned was how to properly hide elements. So we already know that display none will visually hide elements on a screen, but we learned that you should not rely on that to hide elements from a screen reader. We also knew that RE Hidden would hide elements from a screen reader and does not hide elements on a screen. Um, but we realized that hidden is the most effective way if you want to hide elements both from a screen reader and on the screen. So essentially, using the hidden attribute is the equivalent of using both display none and RA hidden set to true. If you are going to use display none, you should couple it with RA hidden, or you can just use the hidden attribute instead. And then cases where you would use the RA hidden attribute are cases like where we had the SVG icon. We wanted to hide that from the screen reader because we were applying the label to the parent element instead. Um, also, decorative elements you can visually hide. You can hide them from the screen reader using ARIA Hidden. The next component we tested was navigation. A similar interaction pattern to our button menu, you have toggles in this menu that can show and hide a, show and hide a sub menu. Um, those toggles are also mixed up with elements that are just links on the page. So in this case, you can see Delore is a link to another page, but Ipsum is a toggle that displays another menu. The first question we had was what button, what, what role should we use for those menu items in our navigation menu? Should it be a button, a link, or a menu item? We had learned when, uh, during our first session with participants, how they use the links list dialog to pull up elements on the page. And we decided that it was important to have all of those elements in the navigation menu to be listed together in the same dialog. And so that meant if we were to use a button role on the toggle, then it would not list, be listed along with the other links in the navigation menu. Um, also, if we were to use menu for the submenu, then we would have to use the role menu item for those links instead of the link role. And those items also would not be listed in the links list dialog. Only the items with the role link would show up in the links list dialog. We knew in, in using a link role for those toggles that we are breaking with standard practice where you should only use links for the elements that are actually links and have a URL value. But in this case, we decided it would provide a better user experience for our users to use a link to toggle the submenu instead of a button. And then the other question we had to decide when we were implementing a test page for this was, do we use ARIA has pop-up or ARIA expanded? We had learned in our previous session that either attribute will communicate to the user that they can click to get something more. But we had also learned that ARIA has pop-up has expectations about what role you apply to that thing that displays. In our case, we would be using menu, and if we were using a menu, we would have to use menu item for the links, and we had already decided that we wanted to use the role link, so that meant we were using ARIA expanded in our case. So in our test page for navigation, we had a nav element with an unordered list of links. And then the submenu also was an unordered list of links inside of a section element inside of the list item that includes the toggle that displays that submenu. We also included a heading inside the submenu that had the same text as the toggle that displayed that submenu. And then like with the one variation I shared of the button menu, we used RA expanded and the hidden attribute on the, the menu. 
So our participants had no issues with using the role link on those toggles. They understood that when that element received focus and it announced that it was expanded or collapsed, they knew that there was a submenu and whether it was visible or not. So in this case, you can see um, the menu is visible and uh, RA expanded is set to true. The other thing that we learned um, during previous conversations with them and reviewing the button menu was that when they toggle the element to display the menu, they expect it focus to automatically shift to the first menu item. So when we built our test page, we had focus automatically shift to the first menu item in that sub-menu. And our participants didn't experience any issues with this. Um, when our JAWS user toggled that link for science, JAWS announced that it was the environmental science link, and it also announced the label that we gave the section element that contains that sub-menu. But we also noticed when the participant used the links list dialog instead to activate that toggle, it would still shift focus to that first menu item, but nothing was announced. Our participant overcame this issue by shifting focus forward and shifting focus backward the same way that you would kind of feel around when you're in a dark room to figure out where you are to get a, con get a sense of the context of where she was on the screen. But there is a web content accessibility guideline that states that there should be no changes in focus that are not controlled by the user. So if we were to provide, if we were to follow this principle, then that means that focus should stay on the toggle itself and not automatically shift focus to the first menu item. And this is in, in line with inclusive design because if we were to automatically shift focus, for the user thinking that we're optimizing that experience for the user, we run the risk of potentially making it very challenging for other users. So we decided it was better to be conservative and keep focus on the toggle rather than automatically shift focus and run the risk of some users being really confused and disoriented by that. Another question we had, though, was what should happen when the user moves forward? They're in the submenu, they exit the submenu, does it stay open, does it automatically collapse? Um, Adobe has an example of an accessible mega menu where they handle this flow very nicely, and I highly recommend that you Google this example and just play around with it and see how they show and hide the submenus as you just use your tab key, tab through the, the elements, the links in that menu. So we had headings in our submenu. Um, the feedback that we received from one of our participants was that it was helpful to have the heading. Um, as I had shared with you before, there are key commands that let you navigate to specific types of elements. So when she was in a submenu, if she forgot what submenu she was in, she would just use the Shift H key command to shift focus to the heading in that submenu because she had learned in using that menu that there was a heading. ARIA current, its purpose is to announce which link is the current page. So in this example, um, if you navigate to the home page and then you shift focus to that link, JAWS will say home, current link. And our participants understood what that meant. They knew that that meant that that was the page they were currently on. And then there are many examples that use ARIA control this type of interaction pattern. But we found in our test that this attribute is really verbose and pointless for this use case. Um, so with ARIA controls, you provide it the ID value of the element being controlled. In this case, the section with the ID navbar submenu 3 is being controlled by the link that is a toggle. And so when this link receives focus, the section is hidden. So JAWS completely ignores that attribute because as far as JAWS knows, that element doesn't exist on the page. And then once the menu is visible, if you were to place focus on that toggle, it'll announce the element that it controls, and then it provides a key command that the user can use to jump to that menu item. But in our implementation, the menu is the very next item in the DOM. That first menu item is going to be the next element to receive focus by the user. And that is the interaction pattern that these users expect, that when they 
if they have focus on the science toggle link and they move down, they expect focus to immediately go to the science menu. And that down arrow key is much easier and simpler for them to use than the key command that JAWS provides for jumping to the element being controlled. And also in, in previous tests, um, we had noticed when participants would indicate that there's too much information being provided to them. So they, they just want the information they need to know where they are and they don't want to hear any extra information that's just added noise. So in, this is a case where ARIA control seems to just provide more noise, provides no benefit to the user for this specific case. But there are, are UI patterns where ARIA controls would be beneficial. So if you have a toolbar component, for example, and that toolbar has a sort button or a filter button, those sort and filter controls control the list below the toolbar. So that would be a case where you would want to provide them with a way of jumping to that element that's being controlled because the next item in, um, from that filter control or that sort control is going to be another item in the toolbar. So having an easy way to jump to that list that's being controlled is a case where you would want to use ARIA controls. So that's the end of our presentation. If you're interested in seeing our final implementations, um, please visit our Patternfly workspace, pf-next.com, and take a look. Thank you. Any questions? It's lunchtime. Only five minutes over. Yeah, and I think we then start late. I mean, we start twelve five, something like that. Okay. So we was like on time.